In the book of Abraham, you have what are known as facsimiles. Let me pull mine out here. You'll notice th this picture here. Looks very similar to what you see here. This, where, th where did this come from? Well, Joseph Smith, in the mid-1830s, met a guy by the name of Chandler who had some mummies, Egyptian mummies, and he was going around the rural countryside showing these mummies off to people for a fee, kind of like a traveling sideshow. When Joseph Smith's followers saw these mummies, they were very intrigued by them, but along with the mummies was this papyra. And they were certain that Joseph Smith, being a prophet, seer, and revelator, could translate this Egyptian papyra into English. Because, hey, Joseph Smith did it with the Book of Mormon from Reformed Egyptian, Certainly he could do it from these Egyptian papyri and translate it into English. So he has this papyri. Now, this is actually a photograph of the papyri. And if you'll notice here, you see very similar this image also. But you'll notice that parts of the papyri were torn. He did not have the full picture here. So what Joseph Smith does is he ad libs. He fills in the torn parts, so he puts the head of a uh, human here, and he puts the torso of this person laying down with his hands facing up. He fills in the gaps. And then he proceeds to give an explanation as to what these things mean. And there's what he says. He said that this represents the idolatrous priest, Elkanah, who stands ready to sacrifice Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, from which the book gets its name. The bird on the right, he says, number one, is supposed to be the angel of the Lord, and the figures underneath this altar, he calls it, actually represent the gods of Elkanah. Okay? The problem, of course, is he gets it all wrong. <laughs> gets it absolutely wrong. First of all, this is the facsimile as explained by Egyptologist Richard Parker. Now this is a guy who does know what he's talking about. And he will say that what we have here is something that's really not all that unusual. It's a funerary text taken from the Sen Sen text or the Book of Breathings, which is not all that uncommon. But if you look carefully here, we don't see the drawing looking quite the same as Joseph Smith said. We have, for instance, instead of a human head, we have the head of a jackal which if you know anything about Egyptian burial rituals, would be the Egyptian god Anubis. And we also have something missing here. Remember, that part of the parchment was gone. I want you to look very carefully at the midsection of this gentleman. You can wonder why Joseph Smith probably got that one wrong. But anyway, here's what we have according to an Egyptologist. The jackal-headed Anubis standing left to the dead Osiris, not Abraham, who is on this beer, Osiris is about to magically impregnate Isis, which is this bird above him, and the figures below the beer represent the four sons of Horus, and they are in the shape of what we know as canopic jars. Now what are canopic jars? The Egyptians believed that in the afterlife they needed part of their organs to survive, and so they would put their organs in these jars feeling that the deceased would need them later on. Now what's interesting is they would put things like their heart and stuff like that in these jars, but they didn't put the brains in there. The Egyptians didn't think the brains really had much to do with anything. So what they would do with the brains when they would mummify them is they would stick you know, sticks of some sort up the nostrils of the dead and just kind of swish them around and liquefy their brains. I know this is right after lunch too. You know, but uh, nonetheless, you don't see a real similarity between what Joseph Smith said and what this Egyptologist says. Because Smith was doing what he did years before with the Book of Mormon. He was faking it. He was trying to appease the gullible. It worked back then. Why isn't it going to work now? What's amazing is you still hear Mormon scholars trying to defend the Book of Abraham even though I know of no qualified Egyptologist outside of the, uh, outside of the Mormon church that would even come close to saying that that's what this supposedly represents. Or I, sh I should mean what, Brig what Joseph Smith said. This is important though. They have to defend it. And I'll close with this quote. The reason they have to defend it, and I think B.H. Roberts understood the situation quite well. 
In his Comprehensive History of the Church, Volume 2, page 138, he says this, If Joseph Smith's translation of the Egyptian parchment could be discredited and proven false, then doubt would be thrown also upon the genuineness of his translation of the Book of Mormon, and thus all his pretensions as a translator would be exposed and come to naught. B.H. Roberts understood the severity of this. And this is why I think why a lot of Mormon scholars continue to defend the undefendable. They know that once that domino falls, they all start falling. And we get a chain reaction. And we find out, what? That Joseph Smith wasn't the prophet he claimed to be. That in fact he was a false prophet. He was a deceiver and not one to be trusted.